make things as relatable and easy to use as possible and approachable as possible. And I'm applying that to like things that everyone who builds on top of Stripe, you know, that those are problems that I am now tasked with solving. Like, does it feel good? Is it intuitive to use? Uh, even if you don't read the docs, can you still kind of figure things out? Because, you know, not everybody reads the docs. <sighs> you sure? Oh, well, I mean, uh, <laughs> that's the RTFM. Our, our, uh, yeah. our best guess is about 10% of people read the docs. 10%. Welcome, everybody, to the seventh episode of the Front of Masters podcast. I'm Mark Urbanski, CEO of Front of Masters. And today we have Mike North. He's the developer platform tech lead at Stripe. And we talk about everything from our first experience, both being on the TI-83 calculator, getting into programming, all of the way through uh, hardware and programming microcontrollers to typed languages and you know front end versus uh, full stack and then beyond. It's a wide ranging conversation and it's a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoy it. Well, Mike, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, so we'll start out with some warm up questions. First, can you talk to me about rowing and your boat project? Sure. Uh, I have kind of gone through life not finding the thing I love to do to work out. Like, I don't like running a whole lot. And uh, I bought a rowing machine on sort of a, just to take a chance to see if that would be the kind of thing I like doing. And man, has it resonated with me. Like, it feels great. Uh, I have rowed over a million meters, like a thousand kilometers in the past uh, year and a half or so. And uh, I decided I want to take it to the next level because I know I like doing it. So I bought a boat kit. It's a uh, construction type. It's called Stitch and Glue, where you get a bunch of slats and you attach them together into a boat shape using copper wire. And then you glue them all together and you, you get a boat. So it, it was kind of weird. It came as like a... A shipment looked like a stack of pieces of plywood, and now I've got a 20-foot boat in my garage that I'm working on, and we're going to put two sliding seats in it, and I have the oars, and uh, we live right next to Lake Washington in the Seattle area, so I hope I can a couple times a week, uh, you know, starting next year, get out there on the water. So it's and, like one of those two-person ones. Yep, that, yeah. my wife and I can get in it, although she's told me I shouldn't really bother putting the second set of paddles in there, and I can get an extra workout just by... Rowing her, rowing her around. She'll just point in a direction <laughs> and, uh, you know, instruct me, which is, that's that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then one other project you talked about was your uh, new office. Could you talk about that? Yeah. So uh, when we bought our first house, there was kind of this barn type building. So it's still like a home office? It's a home office. It was originally uh, the office of the person who built the house. Mm. and But this was in like the 1960s. And uh, when we got the house, it was sort of, it had just been left there basically to rot, like literally. Mm -hmm. um, so my wife and I have spent a lot of time like putting a new roof on it and new like cedar shingles on the side. And we got like hardwood floors in there now. Um, I got a chance to do my own electrical work because I, I started out as a construction worker. That was like my, my high school job hmm. um, for several years in a row. So like. What I, type of construction? Uh, we built condos okay. in downtown DC, hmm. right? But I was in there kind of uh, like hooking up dishwashers and things like that. And mm -hmm. I learned learned a little bit how to do this. So I decided to try that myself. We got the inspector in there. Apparently I didn't screw anything up. Not going to start any fires. Nice. Um, knock on wood. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of, it was a big project I did when I was transitioning between jobs uh, about a year and a half for two years ago. Um, I spent spent a couple weeks, you know, doing all of that, and now I get to live live inside that project, and it turned out great. Yeah, you showed me pictures. It looks beautiful. Yep, absolutely. Yep. There's like a pickleball court in the front of it. Yeah, yeah, we got a pickleball court. I, I actually I have a pitching machine now, so I can just like go out there and hit hit a hundred balls and then fill it back up. So hopefully, I'll start getting pretty good. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to play sometime. Absolutely. Um, all right, so one more warm-up question. Uh, okay, I guess two more. Whatever, I lied. Um, are there any special skills that you have that people might not know about? Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's a skill I might not have anymore, but I'm sure I could pick it up again. 
I uh, played jazz piano for about 16 years, hmm. and uh, I have played at the Kennedy Center. Wow. So I was in I was in a band where almost every other member of the band has turned into like they ended up being a professional musician. Um, wow, some serious piano. Yes. Well, uh, uh, a serious band. I, a serious I was, band. <laughs> I was uh, like white knuckling my way through it, but sure. when you're playing with a group like that, yeah. it, it's sort of uh, you know. Even if you're if you're like the scrub in that group, you're actually still like objectively, uh, you know, pretty decent. Nice. Which is that's a spot I love to be in, right? I I actually like being surrounded by people who are like better at something or smarter than me in some way, and because uh, that's you know it's little it's it's hard, but that's when you know when you're growing, right? When you can sort of uh, learn from people around you and uh, you know have things that you can model from them. Absolutely. And uh, so you and I have worked together for quite a long time. I think it's been almost a decade, right? Yep. So is there anything like weird that yeah. you've seen me do? So uh, <laughs> when, when we're done recording a workshop, usually we will record the promo video for it at the end, um, you know, where it's, it's sort of like the teaser for the course where you're, you know, it's yeah. about 60 seconds or so where we say, like, what's this course about? And on numerous occasions, you've you've gone into like a, a Rick and Morty type uh, <laughs> mode where you're you're like impersonating both Rick and Morty, and unfortunately, like when people in the room start laughing, I I can't stay serious. So I I do remember we've gone through like probably close to a dozen takes where I'm like spit taking halfway through, uh, you know. Just trying to say, like, these are the topics that we're going to cover, and I see you, like, you know, giving me some face, and uh, yeah, can't. It's kind of like the hard work is done. We've been working all day. It is, and then uh, it's like, yeah, maybe I get too. You go into goofy mode a little too early, so little. uh, Yeah, I'll I'll (laughs) work on that. Uh, It's fun. It's fun. (laughs) All right, so let's talk about growing up. Uh, Can you talk about uh, growing up and like maybe how you got? Exposed to code, that kind of thing. Yep. Maybe some of your background or whatever. Yeah, I guess some of my earliest coding experience, if we sort of, yeah, this isn't broadening the definition of coding. I was one of those kids with a uh, TI-83 graphing calculator that would like find a way to like download a snake game on it, and then I would go in and change the code a little That's bit. That's exactly how I learned how to code. Right? Uh, it's you right and I there. have never talked about this, but that is exactly it's It's on the device, right? Yeah, it's all, yeah, exactly. it's a self-contained thing. It's a very mm. simple language. And uh, I had this urge, even like mechanically, to sort of take things apart and see how they work. And yep. with code, it was like this non-destructive way of doing that, where like if you screw it up and you can't figure out like how to, how to get it back, you can just like delete it and get that thing again from where you where you copied it from mm-hmm. and it's all working again. Yeah. So that was probably my earliest uh you know earliest experience there. Uh later like in my teens I had like a I would hardly call it a business but I I would uh help like doctors offices and lawyers um set up their first PC. So I would order a lot of like Dell and Gateway 2000 PCs where they like they would pay for it, but I would sort of spec it out for them. Mm-hmm. And then they of course would get these boxes and they don't know what the hell to do with this thing. Um so I would get in there like on a you know on a weekend and like set it up for them and get it all going and you know install all the stuff. It's not really programming, but it was sort of like very early exposure to hardware and software. Hardware and software. And that this of course like People who are a little younger than us might not remember that this is a time where, like, you had to figure out the right drivers. Like, nothing was yep. plug and play, and so it was a there was a lot of debugging involved in sort of getting everything working properly. Yes, similarly, right. around that time period, I was trying to play Half Life because my family had gotten a computer, and I could not. It, it was just it wasn't working, and I just didn't understand. This is a new computer, and so that's where I had to learn. Okay, what is a graphics card? Uh, what is a sound card? Like, figure out how to swap those parts out. Yep. Figure out the drivers, like you're talking about with with games. And really, that was how I got into you know configuring hardware. And similar to you, also sold these computers to businesses and people and built them. So it was, yeah, interesting that we have that same background in common. Um, uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, school. So you. Uh, where did you go to school? What was your kind of? Um, I, I went to path? Uh, 
Yeah, I went to Carnegie uh, Mellon for uh, like I <laughs> like funnily enough, I I got into their engineering program, and I remember saying like, you know, kill me if you ever see me like staring at a blue screen and writing code. Like I I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. Mm. I really enjoyed um, you know putting hardware together. I would make for example, like a, a DC power supply where you get like alternating current going in and then you have a couple like filtering capacitors and something called a bridge rectifier in there so that you can get like a DC output that you can adjust whatever voltage you want. Um, I really liked putting that together and I hadn't yet realized that that's just, these are just systems, right? There's, you know, whether you're physically putting something together or you're building a bunch of software modules that sort of work together, it you kind of think about it in the same way. Like if you diagram it on a whiteboard, it's mm -hmm. it's all the same. Um, so when I got into college uh, for mechanical engineering and physics, I I found that you know I could do that work and it was interesting. But the things I liked most were when we started to solve mechanical engineering problems with numerical methods. Right? These are things where there's no formula you can use to solve a problem. You kind of have to sort of iteratively solve it and converge, you know, like each each iteration is sort of a refinement and you converge on the result. So these are what they call like open form solutions. Sometimes it means you have like more variables than equations in a system of equations. But I really loved, you know, writing a simple piece of code and getting to that answer and the ability to sort of like, you know, maybe brute force your way to it and then try to find like little optimizations you can make to get there faster. So what's like an example problem that you solved? So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll actually, I can answer that question by telling you about sort of the next phase okay. of my career. One of these open form problems has to do with uh, studying fluid mechanics. So if you want to know what the airflow looks like over a particular shape of car, today you use something called computational fluid dynamics. And that is Effectively, it's the idea of taking all that air around the car and breaking it up into little pieces. These are usually like voxels or tetrahedron shaped things. And you can kind of, in each of those little voxels, solve for like what's the direction of the air, how fast is it going, even, even temperature sometimes. And you, there's no way you can sort of solve that all at once. Like if you have a bridge and you're looking for like the structural forces on a bridge, there's a way to sort of go through the different loads and like what, what kind of steel are you using? How thick is the beam? What does its cross section look like? like? You can by hand go through and solve that. The way these fluid mechanics problems work, you kind of solve it once and you get a rough answer and you feed that answer back into the beginning and then you can solve it again and it, you get a refined answer. And you do that over and over and over. Um, sometimes you let your computer run all night continuing to refine and refine and refine. And then you decide you have an answer once sort of the rate of change between subsequent tries, mm -hmm. it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Kind of reminds me of machine learning in a way. A little bit. But like, yeah, you were talking about like 2006. Well, I mean, machine learning is similar in that yeah. you want to train and train yeah. and train and you're, you're sort of validating, like, are, are we good enough? Are we close enough? Maybe you have some test... Um, task that you're asking your model to perform. I think they're both, you know, they, they're both yeah. solved incrementally and you sort of have to say like, we'll never reach Keep the feeding it more data until yep. it gets like it gets constant good. or yep. close to constant. Yeah. So then, yeah, I was taking a look at like your first job and I saw something about OpenGL and this kind of thing. Is, is yeah. that what you're talking about? It is. My grad school project was solving one of these fluid mechanics problems for uh, Honda Research and Development. So mm -hmm. they, they sponsored my uh, postgraduate work. And uh, what I ended up doing was like, instead of just kind of finding the algorithm, I built a tool because in my mind, the point was that some engineer over at Honda wants to take my work and they want to use it. And especially when you have something like this, where it's sort of refinement over time, you know, sometimes you want to look at all these pieces of air and you want to say, oh, slice them up more finely in this area. Like, because there's going to be a vortex, maybe around the wheel or over the spoiler on the top of the trunk. And so I made this OpenGL tool where you could sort of select 
some some of these voxels and like refine them or or align the mesh, you know, in a, in a different way. And my uh, my professor was mad at me for this because he felt that I should be just focusing on basically a white paper. And I I had built this tool with OpenGL. I was using um, like Win32. And uh, I think it was Windows Foundation classes at the time was their sort of like standard library. And at that moment, something clicked for me. And I, was, I, I realized, like, I'm actually not in it at all to, to get the algorithm. Like, I want to build things that are useful for people. I want to make it easier for people to benefit from this. And that's, that's a point where I, I kind of started to decide that I, like, the academic sector was not right for me. Like, I don't get the satisfaction out of that, that some people do, where they just love doing the research and getting deep into it. And it's very important work, but it doesn't scratch my itch. Still, it seems very cool and like much more productive than what I was doing at college. So this is where our careers took a fork. <laughs> yeah. So then you went to uh, Siemens, yeah, right? And, and like I, I saw like Java on there and yep. Spring. So, so um, I very enterprisey sounding job. So after, uh, it's, it's enterprisey now, mm. but it, it kind of wasn't at the time. So I, I ended up, as I was figuring out that like I didn't want to finish my uh, PhD program, I uh, found this company that was, so I was in you know Pittsburgh, which is where Carnegie Mellon is. In State College, Pennsylvania, which is just a couple hours away, there was a company called CD Adapco, which later was acquired by Siemens. And they were solving exactly the problem that I was trying to solve with my research. But they were so far ahead, right? They had a team of, you know, maybe like over 100 engineers, some that were specialists in like the, the you know, modeling of that air into little voxels, and some that were, uh, you know, very engaged with like automakers, such as uh, like the Daimler Auto Group that, that owns Mercedes. Um, so I interviewed with them, and it was basically like, I just realized in that moment, it really tipped the scale for me where I, I was like, my, my research is pointless. Like it's, I'm here as a grad student, you know, I was like, you know, 25 years old and I had no shot at like competing or doing something that's novel or useful for these like, you know, very experienced, uh, you know, experts and software engineers. So I ended up um, working for them and they were building like a, commercial piece of software that did the kind of thing that I was trying to do. Like you mm. open this thing up and you can do exactly what I'd been doing with OpenGL. They were mm. using OpenGL. Cool. Um, and my, my mission there was to make it easier to use, right? So when I joined the company, you kind of, you almost needed a postgraduate education to like understand what you're doing with this. Like you have to select, you know, which equations do I want to use to solve this problem? Like, should I use the Navier-Stokes equation or, you know, some other equation? Like, is there laminar flow or should I optimize for turbulent flow? And I, I spent a lot of time trying to make it more approachable and trying to make it so that, you know, we could broaden the user base. Um, so I spent a lot of time in doing uh, work in Java. So this, this was actually built on top of NetBeans, which was a popular IDE, mm -hmm. but we used kind of like the tree component where normally it would be like folders and files for your code. And then um, as, as like where you'd expect to see your code in this, in this IDE like thing, you'd have this nice um, OpenGL viewport where you could sort of rotate things around and select things. Mm -hmm. um, but that, so like our client was a Java application where we used Swing. And then the back end was C++, and we used like XML RPC to communicate back and forth between these things. Mm -hmm. And I remember also wrestling with like building for multiple CPU architectures where we had these complicated build scripts. We had to work on like x86, but also like AIX, which was a popular, uh, you know, IBM based architecture at the time. Uh, I think we had like PowerPC, which was not just a, uh, not just a Mac thing, although Mac kind of made it popular with their their early processors. HPUX was another architecture, so that was that was also some of my early experience, like wrestling with C plus plus and figuring out the like, oh, the, we can't run the optimized code on this architecture because it's not happy with it. So like, you know, tuning that kind of thing for hmm. uh, performance was was an interesting experience. 
Yeah, I mean, working with like 3D and stuff like that, you must have had some super powerful machines too that you're working yep. on back then. Yeah, some That's... of the old like Xeon processors with uh, not gaming yeah. GPUs, but right. GPUs that had a ton of working memory. In a video game, you, you only need to render sort of what you're looking at. Like as yeah. you look into the distance, it gets very coarse. Whereas a simulation, when you're trying you need, to get like yeah, you want all of those exactly, you need to there. simulate like every single particle, basically. You got it. Absolutely. Um, then, like, how did you go from there to, yep. to like front end, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I'm like looking at the so, the career timeline. At, at the time, right, like we were releasing software, we'd print CDs every quarter and mail them out to to our customers. Uh, I remember seeing like Steve Jobs's iPhone keynote where he was demoing that like you get a uh, what he called the desktop class web browser, which you know compared to what came before it, it's it was an amazing mobile web browser. But I remember watching this, this keynote for the iPhone, the first iPhone, and thinking, I'm going to like keep going in this direction of like desktop software for mechanical engineering experts that's printed on CDs and shipped. And the world is moving towards the internet and mm -hmm. web development. And we didn't know about iOS apps at the time. Um, but I was, I had this sense of like, I'm going to miss this wave and I'm going to regret it. So I started a, like a, basically a freelancing company that I would run during the evenings and I would take on new jobs. And my requirement for these jobs would be, it has to include one piece of technology that I am not experienced with yet. And it was sort of like, I would take, you know, a very small amount of money compared to what I was earning at my day job, but I'd get a chance to learn about, you know, writing a printer driver or working with Ruby on Rails or something like that. And doing that for a couple years, and it was it was hard, you know, it was like, it felt like working two jobs. Mm -hmm. um, that gave me enough that when I decided to leave my day job, I interviewed for a lead web development position. And I got them to say, you know, to to look at my experience and I, I could say, look, this experience from my day job proves that I'm a solid software engineer mm -hmm. and this portfolio of freelance projects proves that I have the skills that you want in the front end here. Mm -hmm. And that that's how I managed to sort of make the leap into the front end world. Got it. Yeah, and then uh, somewhere around there, you got hired like at Yahoo, right? And that was kind of like in Yahoo's heyday. Eh. It was right. after the heyday. Oh, after the heyday, okay. It, it was in was Yahoo's like, declining period. Okay, because I remember that Yahoo had like all the best engineers, and they were, you know, building YUI and all this cool stuff. Yeah, that, that wasn't the so Yahoo okay. I was at. Okay, all right. But all right. this this was um, this was at a time when Marissa Mayer had taken over as a CEO, mm. and uh, I took a risk. Right, I I thought, and you know, no regrets at all. Like I can't. I'm happy with where I have ended up. Overall, mm -hmm. like I don't want to second guess any of the steps that it took to get there, um, but you know, part of me thought that this could be one of the great business turnaround stories, where like Apple was really on the rocks in the late '90s, mm -hmm. uh, and they turned it around, and like look where they are now. Like they're a multi-trillion-dollar company. Right. IBM shifted away from building like IBM compatible, you know, 286 and 386 PCs. Like they lost that business to. Companies like Dell, right? They're not selling home PCs, um, but they're doing great with business consulting. And I thought Yahoo might be able to be like the the, uh, the next big turnaround story. And I actually turned down a couple offers from companies that were like more objectively successful because mm -hmm. I thought, like, you know, I thought it was interesting to take on something that was sort of in a troubled state mm -hmm. uh, rather than you know taking something like working on something that's sort of already established as being great. And mm -hmm. you could sort of. You wanted the challenge. I wanted the challenge. And I thought, you know, if you get something that's, that's already like amazing, it's, it's, you can screw it up. Like, uh, you know, there, there's a lot more risk associated with, you know, taking something that's already found fit and all of that. I, I don't really think about things in that way anymore, sure, sure. but, but I kind of saw, like the big swing of like company in crisis to like, look, we can help the company make some money now. Um, and then you transitioned to LinkedIn, right? I did. And, uh, and at well, some there, point you got into teaching there's, in there, yeah. So um, Yahoo's, when I when I joined Yahoo, they had this like 
every team can have their own tech stack mm -hmm. um, policy, which is great if you really value kind of like piecing a bunch of different technologies together. And like maybe at that time, there were a lot of people that liked gulp versus grunt, you know? And, uh, but the problem was you couldn't move people between teams very easily. And like sometimes projects end up merging together and it, it gets very messy if things are not, um, if you have like very opinionated things, but in different directions, you, it's harder to, to join them together. So at Yahoo, we, we took on uh, Ember.js as our you know, framework of choice. It was that or Angular 1 at the time. React did not exist um, mm. at this time. So we, uh, that, that's where I started to learn Ember. And I ended up, as part of shifting the company towards Ember, teaching a lot of developers you know, how does this work? How do you think about this? And, you know, there were n over a dozen teams that sort of had to make this shift. And I, I got very good at like sitting down with them and saying like, you know, how do you think about your app right now? Like if you explain it to me, I can help you figure out how to model that in Ember. And I, I had a lot of fun doing this. Like it was an energy, energy generating activity for me. So uh, after Yahoo, like I had a small time at a startup but uh, I had started to do courses for front-end masters. Yeah, right? how did that come about? You, uh, I think, how did that come about? How did you and I get in contact <laughs> with each other? Yeah, I have no idea. I like, think that... It's um, a decade ago. It's kind of I think that, fuzzy. Gosh, it's fuzzy. I'm, this may be incorrect, but it's, it's my recollection. I think you were looking for somebody to cover the topic. And you might have been reaching out to some, like, some core team members like Tom Dale or Yehuda Katz. Yeah, I think that is true because I I knew Yehuda from like the jQuery community. Yep. And yeah, he obviously created Ember and all that kind of stuff. So I think at yep. the time, Ember was like in the running for like one of those you know he, a tier frameworks or whatever. And so yeah, I was looking for a teacher, and I think he passed he, it off to you. He definitely created Ember, but um, interestingly enough. The first commit into Ember.js was bringing Sprout Core 2, which is an Apple framework, into a new repo, which then was Ember.js. Yeah, think, uh, I, I sort of remember Sprout Core even yep. back in the day. It feels very, very Ember-y there. All, all um, these uh, words that are yep. no longer in the front end vernacular For sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and he, he and uh, Yehuda and Tom Dale, I think, were, they were involved in Sprout Core as well. Sure. So it was sort of like they, yeah. they brought it out of Apple and into a fully independent project. Um, yeah, so so uh, you and I ended up getting in touch with each other, and I, that's when I taught my, my first course for front-end masters. And I, um, while I was working for this startup, which, you know, after Yahoo, I, I was going around and helping companies, like other companies, learn how to use Ember and how to be successful with Ember. And uh, after a couple years, LinkedIn, started to do a big rewrite where they mm. were moving towards Ember as their framework of choice. It's still what LinkedIn.com is built on today. And they reached out to me and said, like, you know, we have, like, uh, several hundred web developers here. And, you know, we're confident that we can solve the technical problem of getting the build working and, like, you know, reducing the amount of code we're sending, we're sending out. Uh, but part of the bigger bigger challenge is like, how do you get all of these engineers productive? How do we teach them how to think about Ember? And so uh, I worked out an arrangement where I came in and for my first couple of years at the company, I was just teaching workshops like four days a week, eight mm -hmm. hours a day. I'd bring in, you know, somewhere between 20 and 50 engineers at a time. And we'd go through uh, Ember, but a variety of other topics like I had uh, a lot of autonomy in terms of what I could teach, so I even got into some some weirder topics where we we do like functional programming with Elixir, but I did that deliberately because it's a weird programming language or it's unfamiliar if you're a JavaScript developer, but it shakes you out of your rut where you're thinking about like a very JavaScripty way of programming, and it it's a great way to like teach people what is functional programming. I what do you do with like a language that only has immutable values, and then you can bring that back into JavaScript? Absolutely, I think uh, expanding your horizon and learning something else. Like, yeah, you know, I think a lot of people are 
just seeing what Rust is all about or like different languages. Yep. Anytime you go and learn another language, you're going to come back to your day job or whatever with, with a new set of absolutely um, perspective. So yeah. And that like you, that's interesting. So you were teaching LinkedIn, a lot of engineers and then <laughs> kind of teaching those courses back at front of masters. So you became like a really prolific, you know, instructor through that process. And, uh, yeah, and then uh, from there, I would say, uh, well, before I, I want to get into the next thing, what what's your advice uh, on teaching, like getting into teaching, like seeing your path, like, um, I don't know, like how, how did you end up being like, this is what I need to do? So I think like an advice I would have for new, for people who are looking to teach, I guess yeah. that's the question you're, you're asking. Yeah. Uh, I would say first really tap into your empathy. I, the most successful teachers I know of, like the people I look up to, they uh, they slow down and they they get genuine satisfaction out of helping somebody else get through a problem and you know watching a light bulb turn on. The, the thing I would sort of fight against is, uh, or the thing that I see in unsuccessful teachers is, when you're trying to sort of demonstrate something about yourself, right? To to demonstrate how much you know, or how smart you are, or how complicated things can get. Um, I think this is where I, I respect a lot of people who use like very common terminology to describe things and where I sort of have little like red flags that go up when I hear somebody trying to teach, but they're getting into... Uh, like I could teach TypeScript in, in, from the perspective of like category theory and Haskell. And yes, it would be correct. It would be a valid way to learn about type systems, but it's not relatable and it's not actually going to help the most people sort of click with a particular thing. So I think really it's about like empathy and then making your content as accessible to as many people as you can. That's how you're going to reach the most people. And do the most good, you know? Yeah, and you mentioned uh, TypeScript. Like, that, I think that's been your most successful material to date. And you really kind of picked that pretty early, you know, um, relatively, I feel like. Yeah. You were, you were early on the TypeScript train. Like, what, what drew you to TypeScript? Well, first off, it's my, it's my background. So I mentioned early in my career, I was doing, like, for the, with that fluid mechanics company that yeah. later became Siemens. Uh, I was using Java and C++. They are both strongly typed. And even earlier in my career, I uh, I was in college. I was a teaching assistant for a course about microcontrollers, and we would use like a subset, a small subset of the C programming language, which is still, you know, has static types. Uh, I have always thought in terms of static types, even with a dynamic programming language. Like I am remembering like that's a string, I should only ever assign it to a string. And so I had this natural affinity to sort of like, this felt like a missing piece to me where you can add these back in, you can still get all of the benefits of the JavaScript ecosystem and of JavaScript being runnable like basically anywhere. Mm. Um, but this, this helps you stay more organized. And like in particular at LinkedIn, I was seeing like the larger scale a project gets and the more complicated, you know, data models get, the easier it is even for very experienced engineers to sort of trip over their own shoelaces. It's not a skill issue. It's, it's an issue of um, there being more to remember than any one person can sort of keep in the front of their mind as they're, as they're working on stuff. And TypeScript helps a lot with that. It lets you encode those things that you otherwise would have to remember right onto the, into the source code. Cool. So for you, it was just like an obvious thing. Like this is, this it was is a an hole that I'd been waiting to be filled sure. by something. You know. Yeah. So that's what you think you would. Yeah. So from your perspective, like the traction of TypeScript doesn't surprise you. No, it doesn't. And um, I think where where it really clicked for me that TypeScript was going to be a big deal is some sometime around 2015, uh, leading into 2015, where we were defining. You know, ES6 was becoming a thing, and that's where, you know, you saw TypeScript, they had been needing to go their own way, because between ES5 and ES6, I think, 
isn't that about 11 years or something? Yeah. Like JavaScript as a language was pretty stagnant, you know, in the late 2010s and the early 20 teens. Mm -hmm. And um, around 2015, you know, ES, ES6 or ES2015, um, that's where TypeScript started to sort of align towards the language and say, we're not trying to go our own way. We're trying to be a syntactic superset of JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And that's where it clicked for me that like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so easy for people to adopt. And we were already starting to see projects like 6 to 5, which later became Babel, where you know people wanted to use modern syntax, even though that syntax wouldn't work in in browsers yet. Mm -hmm. um, and TypeScript is just that, right? It lets you use things that are not present in the language, but they all compile down mm -hmm. to runnable JavaScript. Makes sense. And then, okay, so then you went from the front end work to eventually getting into Stripe, right? And like, you have a kind of much more yeah, the, encompassing role there, right? There's, there's a little bit of a middle ground there. Sure. So as I taught, uh, as I was teaching these workshops at LinkedIn, mm -hmm. I would find parts about Ember or parts about LinkedIn's internal infrastructure, you know, our internal libraries that were confusing. And I'd run that back, that feedback back to the teams that own these things or to the Ember core team. And I sort of ended up following that. Like that was, that was valuable enough that the company ultimately tasked me with working on developer productivity. Um, first for front end engineers, but then then more broadly. So I was um, part of the early formation of a team called Human Factors Engineering, which is just sort of like developer ergonomics. And this like, is at LinkedIn. This is at LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and uh, so so I eventually that became like more valuable to the company than teaching. This was like my last couple of years, and uh, when you know I I was looking for a change. Like I was at LinkedIn for almost five years, and I felt like you know, wanted to try something new. Um, I interviewed with Stripe, and now I'm effectively working on like external developer productivity. So I'm, I uh, am the tech lead for their developer platform org, which is like all of the SDKs, the VS Code extension, the Stripe CLI, the web-based CLI, which is called Stripe Shell, a bunch of other things. And so I'm, I'm sort of taking that empathy from teaching and this. Um, this desire to sort of make things as relatable and easy to use as possible and approachable as possible. And I'm applying that to like things that everyone who builds on top of Stripe, you know, that those are problems that I am now tasked with solving. Like, does it feel good? Is it intuitive to use? Uh, even if you don't read the docs, can you still kind of figure things out? Because, you know, not everybody reads the docs. <sighs> you sure? Oh, well, I mean, uh, <laughs> That is the RTFM. Our our uh, yeah. our best guess is about ten percent of people read the docs. Ten percent. Ten percent. But those who do read the docs are are happy. Like we have great docs. Yeah. But we got to make sure that the other ninety percent don't. Um, you know. You know that's probably a way to get yourself in the top ten percent of engineers is just to read the docs. Indeed. <laughs> there, there's your. Uh, it, it certainly your golden, pays for itself. <laughs> yeah. There's your golden. Uh, You're gonna spend. An Golden hour tip. doing that, yeah. You'll spend an hour reading the docs, or you'll spend many hours wondering why something didn't work exactly as you expected to. Yeah, I, I think people are a lot of times shocked how much of these web APIs I know, and it's like sometimes it's as a there. hobby, I just go to MDN and just look, like, see if I can find something that I haven't. The information's all there. Yeah. At, at the same time, you know, we we do try to meet developers where they are. Yeah. Like not everyone is going to read uh, the owner's manual cover to cover, and you, know, you shouldn't have to if you want to do something basic. So yeah. we kind of we think about those two uh, different groups of people, and we want to serve them both. Yeah. So yeah, your job is to to serve one hundred percent of the developers. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. Read the docs, people. Come on. So, uh, an interesting, <laughs> just connecting this back to TypeScript. Yeah. Um, TypeScript has helped me, um, you know, initially lead the effort and now it's sort of graduated into a company wide thing where a bunch of like principal staff and distinguished engineers guide it now. Mm -hmm. um, defining API semantics for Stripe. So, if you use our public API, you'll see things have certain shapes, like we use carefully chosen verbs to perform operations on things. And TypeScript and domain modeling, right? The idea of like taking a problem, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, if you have a calendar, well, you probably have like an event and a participant 
and maybe you have an alarm and there could be more than one alarm, like remind me five minutes before or 10 minutes before. So take that way of thinking combined with thinking about types and, you know, what's a safe type to start with? And like, can we, does that give us room to sort of evolve it and add more features over time? Or have we designed a type where we have to pour cement around it? Like it's, it's, we can't touch it now or we'll break tons of people. Like, the TypeScript skill set really, really helped with taking that on. Like API design and types are just so uh, intertwined. Yeah, and I mean, Stripe has an amazing reputation for, you know, great APIs and that kind of thing. We so, still think yeah. we can do better. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Um, you know, you talked about, I, th I think, can't remember when we were talking about this, but this transition of, I'm a front-end engineer, and there's, like, pressure on me to, like, grow and making that choice of like, where do I grow from there? Yep. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, this, this is just it's a typical thing to find on sort of the individual contributor um, job ladder, where you can, you know, you can be like an entry level engineer, and you're like, you can code pretty well, you know, you're very productive on your own. Maybe you you don't yet understand sort of the broader picture of what you're trying to do. Um, like how, how software pieces fit together. But but that that comes with, you know, maybe a senior role where you kind of understand the bigger picture. You don't have to be fed individual tasks. And then there's usually another level above that that's like staff engineer where you can be handed like a nebulous, murky problem to solve. And like, it's your responsibility to figure out what that solution looks like. As you keep going up, you really can't be a front end, a pure front end specialist anymore. I mean, they exist, right? Like Google has super, super senior engineers that work on uh, Chrome or work on, you know, very, like work on Angular. Like I'm sure there are some very senior engineers that work on that, but those are very rare. It's more common to have people as they keep going up, like you, you sort of have to drop the front end and you have to become an engineer. And the most important things are like develop great soft skills where you can, you know, talk to people who are not engineers and like have a productive conversation where everyone understands what's going on. And then they can like go back and be like extremely technical with engineers. Um, but you also have to become that, that generalist a little bit. And that's where, you know, if you're a staff front end engineer right now and you're looking to sort of advance beyond that, I would strongly recommend, you know, getting a little bit of back-end experience, a little distributed system experience, you know, take take a course on that. Yeah, and we have, uh, well, I have to shout out Jem Young's Full Stack for Front End absolutely. Engineers uh, course, which kind of covers on how to deploy um, apps. And then we also have like a DevOps course. So if you go to like frontendmasters.com slash learn slash full stack, like yep. it's, it's kind of all there. It's everything from like and basics of Linux to Containers and yep. Docker to super valuable. all sorts of stuff. So I know SQL. There are also some learn great, SQL. <laughs> learn SQL. Right? SQL's great. You have to you have to be able to talk about a database. Yeah. Um, there's a great course on Python that I have I've taken on Front End Masters. There's uh, I know I think you have a Rust course now, which is fantastic. And it's actually it's not so important that you become an expert in any one particular programming language. Like it's not it's not that like you kind of get to skip over the first few stages of like working with Java or working with C sharp or whatever it is. As you're getting up to becoming like a more um, strategic level engineer, staff or principals, staff you know, or yeah, principal yeah. and beyond, right? I'd say it starts at staff, but sometimes mm -hmm. there's a senior staff, and you you need to be working on Depends this on to get to senior of the staff. Company, of course. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. But um, it's really about like knowing how to think about a database and back end and like what do large scale systems do. And um, the, the encouragement I would give front end developers is you already know how to work with the distributed system a little bit. Like you could think of front ends with back ends as being like an extremely large scale distributed system, right? You've got all of these browsers that are running their code independently. They have to talk to an API. Like there's a lot going on there, right? You could have multiple users logging into an account and they're both trying to edit something and like one one writes first and like how does that update come back? So it's not it's not like a totally different domain. Um, it it can be it can be relatable. 
But knowing that is super important um, to get into that mo more senior level. Good advice. Uh, yeah, so what what are you excited about these days? Like personally or professionally? Like what are you, what's next on the, yeah. the list? Um, I'll, I'll answer that question from like the perspective of, you know, not, not work. Uh, I'm starting like a pretty large scale, like vegetable garden with a little orchard um, with my wife. We're, we're hoping we can get things planted um, next year. Our, our dream is like, have a couple of chickens where we have our own eggs and to sort of not have to buy vegetables at all over the summer. You're speaking our camera guy, John's language over here. He's I'm sure. A, I'm he's sure. a chicken farmer. He seems, he seems like the type. I <laughs> yes. probably could learn some things from him. Um, but yeah, just, it's not, it's not a way to like save money because usually it's more expensive to do this, but it's just the satisfaction mm -hmm. of eating things that you, you grew and, uh, and, and no, it's also nothing better. Nothing tastes better. Nothing tastes better, right? Like and every it's satisfying, like you yep. built, you uh, built it from scratch. Every <laughs> strawberry you, grew you it eat from scratch. Yeah, every strawberry you eat was yeah. like picked at a time where it was. Well, every strawberry you get from a supermarket, um, they're all picked when they're like pretty much hard as rocks, right. and then they, you know, you know they'll they'll turn red, but it's never going to be like this thing is ripe. It's so ripe that you couldn't package it like it would get ruined yeah. on the way to the grocery and so like you get you actually get to taste what these things are like so i'm i'm psyched about that yeah i bought a giant bag of apples from the apple orchard and i ate them all there's like 40 so of them. good <laughs> there's they're all, unbelievable so yeah uh that's making your own orchard that's awesome yep it's gonna be apples pears and cherries cherries do really well in washington Although I've been told I have to put a net over the entire tree when the cherries start to come in or the birds will get every single one before I do. Cool. Uh, any other, like, you know, kind of looking back, tying your career together, like just general themes that you feel like, you know, I did this and this has really paid off for me really well. I think um, first, like not being afraid of failure uh, was helpful for me. It let me take some big risks. And sometimes I ended up like leaving, you know, a mic shaped hole in the wall. Um, but you move on. And uh, if you don't, if you don't take risks, and you try to play it too safe, sometimes that limits what you can do. Um, and then the other thing I would say is don't be afraid of like a very indirect path ending up taking you to a good place. So like, as I've talked about with my story, I started with like, graphing calculators and then microcontrollers and then C++ and Java. And then I went over to web development and then front end and I became a front end expert. And now I'm sort of like, you know, overall engineering skill set. Um, I couldn't have told you how, how I would get to the point I'm at right now. Um, but I'm, I'm glad I bounced around. That actually has served me really well. Sounds like you followed your curiosity at each I stage. Did. Yeah, yeah. I followed my curiosity and I've always chosen... Uh, jobs that excited me and that I was passionate about, even if it wasn't the one that sort of ended up being the, the highest offer. Mm. Um, and you know, that, that's, that's it's a big like deal. Prioritizing learning, like in growth Prior over. Yeah. Prioritizing learning, um, not like making sure you're not the biggest fish in the pond because it's easy to become stagnant there. Um, I tend to move on if I'm the biggest fish in the pond. I, I, I want, mentorship and, uh, you know, people that I can learn from. Uh, and then uh, I would say don't discount, like, your energy and, and passion for a project. It's so much easier to be, like, good at your job if you're genuinely excited about what, what you're building. Mm -hmm. Like, it's any time that excitement is not coming naturally, you're having to sort of pour energy into your work. Mm. to uh, to fuel it, you know, to do the tasks that you need to do. And that's and not something that gives you energy. It's not yeah. something that gives you energy. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. So, Mike, it's been a pleasure. Great chat. Yeah. And uh, we're good. 
Hey there, before you go, don't forget we're new at this. So any feedback, whether it's a like or subscribe, we'll take those or a comment about what you didn't like or what you'd like to see more of in the future. We'll definitely incorporate that into the next episodes. Uh, I'm really enjoying these conversations. So any type of feedback would be fantastic and especially sharing it with your friends and colleagues. So really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. See you in the next one.